Welcome, friends, um, again to the uh, Clinical Academy um, uh, channel. Um, today we are going to talk about neuroendocrine tumors of the uh, pancreas. And neuroendocrine tumors of the uh, pancreas are relatively uh, rare tumors, and they uh, uh, probably constitute less than um, 3% of all uh, pancreatic uh, tumors, uh, but it's uh, an important topic. Uh, that you need to uh, familiarize yourself with uh, what it is, uh, how does it uh, appear clinically, how do we investigate them, and what treatment uh, will be needed. Now, in terms of um, uh, histology, neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas also are called the islet cell tumors. The pancreas has got what we call the islet cells, and the islet cells of Langerhan are uh, neuroendocrine uh, cells that secrete a variety of uh, uh, hormones. These hormones are uh, insulin, uh, glucose, glucagon, uh, vasoactive intestinal uh, peptide, uh, amongst uh, other uh, peptides. Now, we Today, particularly talking about the non-functioning variant of pancreatic uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. This means that they do not produce a hormone that lead to a clinical syndrome. They might produce uh, certain hormones that have minor consequences on the bodily uh, function. There are two theories about where they come from in the pancreas. One of them is the old uh, theory that they arise from the neural crest, and in that sense, they will be similar to what we have in the sympathetic uh, and parasympathetic nerve ganglia, the um, adrenal gland, the uh, medullary cells of the uh, thyroid gland, and the pituitary uh, gland, and the parathyroid. Um, however, recent evidence suggests that they actually arise from the gut uh, endoderm, uh, which makes sense because we know that the endoderm of the uh, gastrointestinal tract does uh, produce uh, cells that could uh, function and produce hormones. Now, majority of the neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, which is 70, uh, more than 70% of them are non-functioning. So they do not produce a specific syndrome. Majority of those are discovered incidentally while the patient uh, is being investigated for unrelated clinical problem, uh, such as biliary colic or uh, renal colic or uh, non-specific abdominal pain, and they appear on CT uh, scan or during these investigations. They can actually cause acute pancreatitis, and a proportion of them will, uh, that will be their first presentation, is in the form of acute pancreatitis, and when we do a CT scan, we find the lesion. They could present with liver metastases. Uh, they could lead to obstructive jaundice if they are in the head of the pancreas, or if they are uh, metastasizing uh, in large masses to the uh, liver, that lead to uh, obstruction of one of, of, one of the major uh, biliary uh, branches. Typically on CT scan, the uh, neuroendocrine tumor, this patient has got two of them, one in the head of the pancreas, one in the tail of the pancreas. Majority of them arise in the body and tail of the pancreas because the uh, Langerhans islets are more abundant in the body and tail of the pancreas than the head and ancillary process. They are usually hyper-enhancing in arterial phase. And we know this is arterial phase because we've got the contrast in the aorta and you can see the arteries that come off the aorta as well, such as the uh, renal arteries. And this lesion uh, is large and it is uh, vividly enhancing on the arterial phase of the uh, CT scan, which tend to be, in fact, pathognomonic for the diagnosis of uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Now, once we found about them, or if uh, we are suspecting their presence, uh, we rely on radiology. Um, 
after the uh, CT scan is uh, done, uh, it could be done only abdominal CT scan. So in that case, we request a chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and the purpose of that to rule out any distant metastases. And um, uh, we need to do a, another series of investigations as uh, well to confirm the presence of the neuroendocrine tumor and to see its extent uh, of metastases if it already had metastasized. So as you said, they are more common in the child and body of the pancreas, and they are uh, arterially enhancing. Uh, and the specific scan that we do for them is called the gallium uh, pit, or the dotate uh, scan. The dotate scan is a modern uh, version of the auxiliary child uh, scan, but it's more uh, accurate. Uh, particularly in tumors who do not have the somatostatic receptors. Now we know that majority of tumors in, of neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas do have the somatostatic receptors on their cell walls, but only 50% of uh, uh, insulinomas uh, do have that characteristics. Pet gallium is, uh, gallium pet is uh, very uh, sensitive and uh, quite specific to uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumors of the pancreas. It will confirm the presence of the primary and show us if there are metastases elsewhere. We do a blood test which is specific for neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which is called the chromogranin A. Now I just need to remind you that the neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, they have got their sister, which is the neuroendocrine tumor of the rest of the gastrointestinal tract, mostly arising in the terminal ileum and the appendix. From a pathological point of view, these tumors are more or less uh, similar. They uh, get uh, categorized and staged in a similar way, and they are treated in a similar manner. Also, those tumors in the intestine uh, are called the carcinoid tumor, uh, and this name has, was coined uh, to them when they were discovered because they look like cancer, uh, but they sometimes behave like cancer. Others, uh, other times, they don't metastasize. Now, it's very important to uh, assess the pathology or the degree of the neoplasia. Are they malignant? Are they potentially malignant? Do they metastasize or not? In 2010, the WHO uh, came up with a classification which used to be quite useful and reproducible. Uh, so we've got the WHO classification of neuroendocrine tumor. So if they are grade one is benign, two intermediate, uh, we treat it like cancer. Uh, grade 3 is definitely malignant, it's called the neuroendocrine carcinoma and behaves like any other cancer, perhaps less uh, ferocious than the uh, pancreatic uh, duct adenocarcinoma. Now, to classify them, we uh, need a few parameters, and these parameters are the number of mitoses that is seen by the pathologist on the specimen, and if the number of mitoses is less than 10, they belong to grade 1, then 2 per 10 high-power field. 2 to 20 per 10 high-power field make them intermediate. 20 or more per, high, per 10 high-power field put them in category 3. And the same thing will be said about the KI67. Now, the KI67 is the uh, proliferative index that the pathologist can uh, measure under the microscope and it is protein produced by the uh, cells and give you uh, an idea about the uh, speed of growth and the malignancy of the tube. So again, it's either less than uh, 2%, uh, 3 to 20%, more than 20%. And also, uh, when the pathologists look at them under the microscope and give them a degree of differentiation. And based on that, uh, you could determine the prognosis and also the treatment that will be uh, needed. The same system will apply to the neuroendocrine tumors of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, which is more, uh, most commonly arise in the terminal ileum and in the appendix. Now, after the diagnosis and after we have staged them with the uh, scans that uh, we had, we will uh, have to make 
a uh, judgment or a decision about how to treat this lesion and uh, based on uh, a few guidelines uh, that all emerge from clinical studies uh, from all over the world, um, we will have certain recommendations to uh, individual patients. Now, in general, if the lesion is less than two centimeters, they are likely to be malignant. They like it to be grade one, uh, and often they do not uh, uh, progress. The two centimeter threshold seems to be a universal uh, convention, but um, there are centers where they remove them if they are 1.5 centimeter. So there is a gray area between the 1.5 and the two centimeter in terms of size of the uh, lesion. Uh, and that will uh, tell us whether we remove them or not. So uh, my threshold is two centimeters, and if they are two or more, I will uh, remove them. If they are symptomatic, like they cause pancreatitis, uh, or for particular concerns uh, on the patient's behalf, we could consider removing them if they are smaller than that. Now, very often uh, these days it's possible to uh, establish the diagnosis in a 100% way where you send the patient to uh, uh, a specialist to do uh, endoscopic ultrasonography and fine needle aspiration. And on the fine needle aspiration, it's possible to assess the degree of differentiation and also the uh, KI 6, uh, 67 index, which will help you to make the uh, decision about the treatment. Lesions that are two centimeters or uh, more, they should be resected. Now, the method of resection or the surgical resection is variable. This could be done laparoscopically by removing the uh, tail uh, or tail and body of the uh, pancreas. Um, if it is in a uh, less accessible area like the neck or head of the pancreas, uh, they could be amenable to what we call inoculation. We just remove the tumor from its surroundings. Uh, and uh, because a lot of these tumors are grade 1 or grade 2, uh, that treatment tend to be satisfactory and there will be uh, no metastases. We will only have to do that if the... Uh, we will only uh, uh, recommend doing that if there is no evidence of local, regional or metastatic disease. If we know that they are grade 2 and grade 3, um, now the patient will need some form of pancreatectomy. The most common operation that we do in this case is a uh, distal or subtotal pancreatectomy with lymph node dissections. And uh, with that operation, uh, the, uh, you could uh, preserve the uh, spleen if you think it's a low-grade tumor. Uh, otherwise, if it is a neuroendocrine carcinoma, we will deal with it uh, like we do deal with the uh, adenocarcinoma of the pancreatic duct with a radical uh, distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy to enable removal of the regional lymph nodes. All these operations are possible laparoscopically or in an open fashion and that depend on the uh, available local expertise. Now, once we remove the um, tumor, we warn the patient that uh, pancreatic surgery is uh, fraught with uh, complications and the risk of having a post-operative pancreatic fistula from distal pancreatectomy is, remains around 25% uh, of the uh, cases pretty high. We leave a drain in there uh, after the uh, operation and we check the uh, amylase uh, serially. I do it on day one and on day three, if there's no amylase in the drain, then we can pull the drain out. And need to follow, now we need to follow the patient up uh, uh, for the uh, long term. I do recommend doing chromogranin A uh, six uh, monthly, particularly for the first two years. Uh, I give them a routine CT scan at 12 months, uh, which will be chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, and then I repeat the chromogram on a six monthly uh, basis. And if the uh, chromogram starts to arise again, we scan them and we start with a CT scan. And if the CT doesn't show us the metastases, we will do a uh, gallium PET scan. Uh, 
and uh, we are meant to follow them up for a minimum of uh, five years. Recurrence uh, is relatively common in high-grade tumors, and uh, the most common site for metastases will be the uh, liver, and if they recur in the liver, there will be uh, other forms of treatment available, which include uh, liver resection uh, or uh, some form of liver-directed uh, therapy. Now, if the pathologist come back to us and or with the bi a biopsy uh, before the operation or after the operation, uh, and particularly if there is lymph node metastases, then we will deal them with them like we deal with uh, uh, any uh, cancer. Uh, so uh, they will have the operation, and then that will be followed by some form of chemotherapy. Unfortunately, uh, we are limited by the uh, efficacy of the available chemotherapeutics um, but that can involve doxorubicin uh, or a variety of other uh, chemotherapeutics um, which have limited effect on the uh, progress of the uh, disease. Now in general adjuvant treatment is not that uh, well established for uh, a neuroendocrine tumor, so they will get the chemotherapy if they have recurrence or they have non-resectable disease. There is no established neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, if they metastasize, the other option, other than chemotherapy, to have a uh, monthly somatostatin analog injection. It's called octreotide. And that tend to slow the growth of the uh, tumor, and also if the tumor is symptomatic or secreting, uh, it will help to reduce the symptoms related to the hormone uh, secretion. It's of proven benefit and have a modest survival uh, benefit as well. Now, for metastatic disease in the uh, liver, we, we resect them, and uh, uh, unlike other cancer, there is a role for what we call debulking surgery. So there is a, a huge burden of the disease uh, in the uh, liver, and we think we can remove 90 to 95% of the mass. Uh, then we will do that, knowing that we uh, are leaving the disease behind. And because we know that uh, uh, does improve their survivability and also improves the quality uh, of their life, and they go on after that to have the monthly somatostatin injection. We get a medical oncologist involved, and there are medical oncologists whose interest in neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, there are new biologic agents uh, like sorafenib uh, and uh, uh, the similar molecular agents. Uh, they are emerging now, and there is some efficacy, but uh, no available biologic uh, agent has emerged uh, yet. Now. So that's all about non-functioning neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, we uh, deal with them uh, that way, and in a nutshell, uh, that uh, what I expect medical students to uh, to know about them. There are a lot more details, uh, but we don't want to get too uh, confused with those. Now you might ask me uh, the, about the functioning because that's the exciting part of the neuroendocrine tumor is that you get the functioning neuroendocrine tumor, and it's exciting to see a patient that has got a syndrome like hypoglycemia or hypergastronemia, uh, and then you, you treat them and you, you see them uh, cure, uh, cured and um, uh, doing well. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into too deep details because I will try to specify a lesson about localization, but we will uh, go over the basics of the functioning materials. Now we know that in the um, in the uh, pancreas we have got the uh, uh, islets of Langerhans, and uh, they have the beta cells that secrete insulin, uh, and these are the origin of insulinomas. Now insulinomas are 90% of the time benign and 90% of the time single solitary lesion. They could be multiple. With the G cells that secrete gastrin, and the D cells are famous in the duodenum and antrum of the stomach, but they could be also in the lower bowel duct. Uh, they might have some D cells which will uh, and might produce gastrinoma. Uh, they are very rare tumor. Uh, gastrinoma is a malignant disease in 90% of the 
uh, turned and uh, uh, very often found in the paraduodenal lymph nodes or the mucosa of the uh, duodenum or the lower bowel duct. And when we treat gastronoma, we have to treat it like any cancer, so we need a formal uh, resection and lymph node resection unless it's outside the uh, duodenum. Now we have got uh, D cells. There are two types of D cells. The one that produce uh, somatostatin, and that can lead to somatostatinoma, an extremely uh, rare disease that uh, leads to or manifests as diabetes. Glucagonoma come from the A cells. Uh, again, uh, glucagon works against insulin and it uh, manifests usually in the form of diabetes uh, with the skin uh, lesions. Vipoma is uh, uh, given to the uh, tumor or the term given to the tumor that produce the VIP, the uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide uh, and they present usually with uh, diarrhea and hypokalemia. Now these lesions are extremely rare. Uh, the most common is insulinoma followed by gastrinoma and the others are uh, very uncommon. When we talk about functioning tumor, we do have to divide them again into two categories. There is the sporadic and there is the familial. The uh, sporadic is some uh, happens to a patient haphazardly uh, with no uh, family history of uh, new, uh, neuroendocrine neoplasia. So we have insulinoma. Uh, usually this manifests in the form of uh, hypoglycemia uh, weight uh, gain, like patients uh, could collapse and uh, become unconscious from hypoglycemia where they are playing uh, uh, golf or at work or whatever they are doing. Uh, they are characterized at the same time, so they are hungry, uh, their blood glucose is very low, high a level of insulin in their uh, blood, uh, and their symptoms uh, get relieved immediately by taking oral sugar. There is an important part or two uh, diagnosing insulin is that you always have to ensure that you've got high C-peptide component of the insulin. Now C-peptide is part of the um, uh, insulin uh, that gets secreted uh, along with the insulin and uh, uh, after the insulin is uh, re released and unpacked, the C-peptide will uh, dissociate itself from the insulin. So it's non-active uh, part of the hormone itself. The problem I need to emphasize that is the fact that if the patient is abusing insulin or someone is trying to sabotage uh, someone else and giving them uh, insulin to induce hypoglycemia, there are famous court cases uh, that were always thought to be related to insulinoma and uh, at the end it was found that uh, it was a sabotage, sabotage uh, action uh, that led to the hypoglycemia rather than uh, a real insulin functioning tumor. Uh, and the key to that is the uh, C-peptide. Now gastrinoma is uh, a tumor that, as we said, um, its origin around the area of the uh, duodenum. Uh, these patients usually present with unusual recurrent bleeding ulcers, like ulcers at the gastroesophageal junction, or ulcers in the second or third part of the duodenum, uh, or ulcers even in the uh, jejunum. And we treat them uh, like you treat peptic ulcers uh, with the eradication of uh, Helicobacter pylori, and they do recur. Uh, now the problem is that they become functioning while the tumor most of the, most often is undetectable with the uh, uh, with the CT scan. So we measure their gastrin level, and then again we do a, a gallium pit, and the gallium pit seems to be very sensitive to uh, localize the uh, gastrinomas. With somatostatinomas and vipomas, they are very rare, and uh, we don't need to uh, waste much time on them. Now, 
I have to warn you that there is a uh, an overlapping problem which uh, students get excited about is the multiple endocrine uh, neoplasia syndrome which is inherited and uh, the inheritance uh, uh, <coughs> give you two types of the uh, disease so we have with type 1 of multiple neuroendocrine tumors uh, or neoplasia and type 2 of multiple new, uh, endocrine neoplasia MEN1 and MEN2 MEN1 uh, is the three P's the adenomas happen in the, th in the, in the uh, organs that start with P Usually they get pancreatic uh, uh, tumors, parathyroid tumors, and pituitary. And the type 2 usually uh, have medullary uh, cancer of the uh, thyroid gland, or they could have pheochromocytoma. And these things will be discussed individually uh, at a later uh, date. Thank you very much for today's uh, attention. Um, I think uh, that will wrap up the basics of neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. Please uh, subscribe to our channel and leave uh, uh, us your comment uh, and suggestions. Thank you.